Hey guys, welcome to episode two of Endo Mentor, which is sponsored by 80 Safari. Uh, big thank you to our sponsors today who are supporting the, um, the series. We are talking today about avoiding complications by making good decisions in Endo. We're going to be talking to Perry Endo, or, uh, uh, who is a uh, really, really good doc from uh, the United States. She actually teaches at Harvard as well. She's a specialist endo, of course, and uh, I hope we're going to learn a lot from her today. So I'm just going to wait and see if she's actually managed to join us yet. Um, let's have a look, scroll down. How's everyone doing today? Hello to everybody that has uh, said hi in the comments there. Uh, I cannot see her just yet. Let's see if she's on. Might just be waiting a minute or two. Uh, whether she's on the live yet or not, uh, she will be in soon. Uh, Dr. Dates, hey, how you doing? Rumor, hi from Liverpool, she says, which is great. Yeah, I better talk about uh, a couple of things that we've got going while we're waiting for her to join us. Uh, we have got now an amazing spence, uh, sponsor, sponsor um, from 80, so, they sent out some bits and pieces which I'll be reviewing as well. So a big thank you to Ape Teeth. Check them out if you haven't already. Um, are you here, Miss Periendo? Let's see. I can see you. Let's send the request. Uh, we also have an exclusive Facebook group where we talk about dentistry and a lot of other things as well. So if you want to join that, the link is in the bio. Um, I can see Hassan there, who's one of the moderators on there. So. Uh, me or Hassan will let you in if you're wanting to join that. Let's see. Can Have you managed to join? Unable to join? Oh dear. Let's hope we can uh, get the dock in pretty soon. Um, hi from India, says Boyshell. Hi. Hey. Let's just get this ready. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you? Awesome. I'm good. Thank you. Been at work this morning on a Sunday of all days. But uh, yeah, you're looking well. Thank you. You as well. I'm trying to get this camera to go a little bit better. How's yeah, that? it dropped half of you. So you've got to redo it once you're actually in, don't you? Um, but yeah, I'm very grateful that you have... Um, been you know found some time to join us and hopefully teach some guys a little bit about endo um we are calling this session avoiding complications by good decision making aren't we um and if anyone knows it we're going to look at the case difficulty assessment form to start with and that's kind of a place to start isn't it yes that's a great place to start um thank you so much for having me and i think that this is a great thing that you're doing um Thank bringing you. awareness to endodontics and also um, making people aware of really what they should be looking at in, in approaching their patients and their cases. Yeah, for sure. I think this series will hopefully be the place that people can go to if they just want to learn uh, and they just want to do better. Wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to uh, pick up this series either today live or you know watch it back at any point and, uh, and learn from some of the best guys out there. Well, thank you. Thank you. A very quick, um, who are you, if you can, to everybody who doesn't know you yet? Okay. Um, my name is Elizabeth Shimperi. I'm an endodontist, and I practice in uh, Western Massachusetts, about an hour and a half away from Boston. I have been in private practice my entire career since I finished my residency. And um, currently, I am also on faculty at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. I um, teach part-time in their advanced graduate endodontic program. So awesome. um, hi to all of my residents out there. They're awesome and so They better all be watching. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they are, but um, I am also very heavily involved in the American Association of Endodontists. I am board certified and I am currently serving on the board of directors of the AAE as well as on a multiple multiple committees 
and I'm involved with the American Dental Association's Code Maintenance Committee. So um, over the past, say, eight years or so, I've really become heavily involved in organized dentistry, which has been also very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I am also a, a wife and a mother. Um, thanks That's to my... Awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks to my family, my husband, yeah. Tony, and my kids, Madison and Connor. They've been really great and instrumental in supporting my career as an endodontist as well. And uh, they're all fantastic. I finally launched my youngest. She just graduated from university. She oh, might wow. be watching. So Madison, if you're watching, hi, I love you. <laughs> and um, she's now out in the world. So, um, you know, with, with the kids all being kind of out of the house, it's, it's really nice because I'm starting to do um, some more things to give back to the specialty yeah. and the profession. Yeah, I, I think you've got a whole load of things going on, which is amazing. Um, and I'm very, very kind of privileged to have you on. Uh, very quickly for the guys who are asking questions, we're going to go through our session first. And then the last 15 minutes of the hour, we're going to answer as many questions as we can. So if you hold on, um, pop your questions in the little question uh, thing in the bottom corner and we'll come to ro- those right at the end uh, but also invite your friends to come and watch as well if you know there's someone who likes dentistry or endo etc etc shall we dive straight in so yes we're looking if you guys don't know at the AAE case assessment form um, and what we're looking at is what the dentist should be able to do for any case to assess and kind of work out what's a good one for you to do what's a good one for someone like uh, Dr. Perry to do Yes, yes. And, you know, um, before we start on that case difficulty assessment form, um, Jabir, what I would like to just review with everybody is the basic principles of endodontics, kind of why we're doing what we're doing. Because I think that sometimes when we are looking at all these beautiful cases of such talented practitioners from around the world on social media or on the Instagram platform, We're so focused on what instruments are you using? What sealer are you using? Mm -hmm. What technique are you using to obturate? And we start to lose lose sight of what is our objective in doing this treatment. And the thing that I want to emphasize is, of course, uh, we are, in doing endodontic treatment, we are, our mission is to eradicate disease, get the patient comfortable, and most importantly, eliminate bacteria, bacterial contamination from the root canals so that number one, we can get them comfortable in the present and also prevent any future infection or complications in the future, all while doing no harm to the patient. So when we're looking at our cases, of course, so important to look at is this a case that I can handle? Because in the end, there is a patient that is connected to this tooth. Mm -hmm. And if we're not able to serve them, then we need to find somebody who can better serve them. And also when we're going in and we're doing this, keeping in mind that we're trying to remove this bacteria and keep that that whole canal system clean. What are the things that we're doing in our procedure that are making sure that we're not only eliminating bacteria, but that we're also not introducing bacteria into this canal system. And I think that um, amongst a lot of practitioners, we start to lose, lose sight of that. So simple things, and I just met with the first year Harvard Endo residents this year, uh, this, this week um, for the first time. And one of the things that I went over with them is really being organized in your setup. Make sure that every single thing that is going into that tooth is sterile. So we don't want to be um, putting our instruments down on say a, a surface that is not sterile or that is not clean. Also, after we're removing caries with an instrument, we don't want to go back into that tooth with that same instruments that has contamination, the bacterial contamination of the caries and go back into that tooth. So either disinfect that, wipe it down with alcohol or whatnot, Mm -hmm. Um, files. This is another big pet peeve of mine with the files. We don't wanna be touching them 
with our with our gloved finger that is perhaps contaminated with saliva because we do that and then we introduce that back into the tooth now we're introducing bacteria into the tooth and if you go back to really one of the landmark oh, studies yeah. yeah of kakahashi et al in 1965 they talked about um, these these mice one group was germ free one group was conventional with normal oral flora and when they made an access into the pulp on these two populations the group that had normal oral flora they developed inflammation of the pulp and eventually pulpal necrosis because of the bacteria and the group that were germ free they developed no inflammation no pulpitis and no pulpal necrosis so you know when oftentimes when i have this conversation even amongst and the dentists, they'll say, well, I'm um, irrigating with sodium hypochlorite and disinfecting it anyway. So, you know, I can put whatever I, you know, touch the files and whatnot. But if you're, say in a vital case, why yeah. would you even want to introduce those bacteria? So, you know, your paper points, your files, your gutter percha points, disinfecting the gutter percha points before you placing them in, and then disinfecting properly during the entire procedure. That's really the thing that I would like everybody to really concentrate and focus on. Yeah, something I think people have maybe not always been 100% aware of, you have to get your assistants in on the act as well, because yes. they are the key to that, I think, because you're kind of, my eyes are glued to a scope most of the time. I'm not looking around at what's going on. So they're in charge of that almost. So That's right. That, that message through. Yeah, That's definitely. right. And um, you know, Dr. Shannon, for Patel, Dr. Professor Shannon Patel. Um, he's out of King's College. He just did a study showing that if you do the simple act of changing your gloves after taking radiographs during an endodontic procedure, you increase the, the prognosis. You increase the um, success of this case because again, many people are touching their files. So you're taking a radiograph, you're inside the mouth, and mm -hmm. then you put everything back on, the rubber dam back on and then you're starting to touch your files and putting them back into the tooth. Now you've just contaminated everything that you've done. So, you know, yeah. think, thinking about that. And of course, the rubber dam is mandatory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One that everyone needs to make sure they are doing if they're not already. Um, yeah, I, I guess the rubber dam is, is the, the most important thing that we use almost. Uh, That's great. I've I've seen a number of cases that I've that I've now retreating that were treated using cotton wool, cotton wool roll isolation and I'm almost kind of banging my head against the wall thinking this would be such an easy case had you done it from first principles but now we've got you know a bite on our hands. Mm. That's right. That's right. Should we go to the form now? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay uh, so starting off guys if you haven't seen the form it's brilliant aaee endodontic case stud, case difficulty assessment form drop that into google you can print it off and just go through it with your patient and you can give them a good in the understanding of what kind of difficulty the case is uh so i recommend that so we're starting off with medical history and the patient considerations yes and i should also mention there is also an app for this Oh. So there's an app and there it is. And so if you pop right into the case assessment, it starts all of the questions right there. So this is a very easy way for anybody to get on there. And, you know, with a, a patient there, you can just enter in all of these different fields. And yeah. at the end, it gives you the level of difficulty and it even allows you to create a uh, referral form with all of this information on it. That's really good. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. What's the app called? It's Endo Case. Endo Case, guys. Check that one out. Yeah, uh, and so I want to give credit to Dr. William Ha. He also has an Instagram Endo Prep app. Endo Prep app. Yeah, yep, he's the one who helped us to to design this this app. Yeah, yeah, he's really he's really good, and um, I know uh, Omar ekram has been involved with that as well, and. Um, I send it every a lot, a lot of the times when I've used it. So, oh, Doc, I've used it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and the name again, there's a question there. The name again is Endo Case, E-N-D-O, capital C-A-S-E. That's it there. Mohammed's put it in. So, guys, check that one. Uh, yeah, medical history. So, we've got the ASA, ASA classes. Yes. 
Yes. So obviously medical history is a big one because of course the patient's medical history and all of dentistry influences how we treat that patient. If this is a patient that has no medical issues, no medical problems, then very straightforward. If however, this is a patient that has any amount of immunocompromise, um, if they're having any serious illnesses or whatnot, then this is something that you really want to look carefully um, at in terms of how you're going to diagnose and manage this, this issue. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, any patient with a, any sort of history of cancers and whatnot that have um, the potential to metastasize, if this is a difficult diagnosis type of case, that's something that we really want to look carefully at and perhaps think about referring to a specialist. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, you will have, you know, you should have taken a full medical history. So you'll be able to work that out. Um, maybe without asking the patient, what's your ASA class or something, you should be able right. to kind of read up, read up on that if you if you need to do so. Um, then we also, if we haven't seen the patient before, they probably had some dental treatment done previously. So you'll be able to ask them about anesthesia how it went, was it difficult, did they need extra? Uh, so that's the second thing. Uh, are there any tips around that that you can give us? Yes, you know, this is, this is an important one for endo, of course, because mm -hmm. you know that oftentimes patients that are coming with endodontic complications or endodontic issues will come in with a hot tooth. So, you know, we know, and as dentists, we all know that any patient that has had difficulty with anesthesia we don't have to draw that out. Yep. They are the ones to tell us that right from the beginning. So, you know, if this is a patient that has a difficulty with anesthesia, difficulty achieving anesthesia, then we want to really make sure that we get this patient profoundly numb prior to doing endo because of course, we don't want to create an experience that they're going to start perpetuating this myth about endodontics. Um, yes, yes. So we have so much um, at our fingertips currently. Um, if you think that this is a really difficult issue for getting the patient numb, then refer it out. Don't even don't even bother with it because mm -hmm. you know that that's not something that you want to have to have that headache. But we have at our fingertips all sorts of different ways to anesthetize a patient. Usually the teeth that are most difficult to get numb, everybody knows, are lower molars. Yeah. So we have the ability to do um, inferior alveolar nerve block. Um, you can also inject a bit higher, do gal gates. Um, that's something that I'll do right from the beginning on a patient that tells me right from the get-go I have some difficulty, difficulty getting numb. We have, of course, the ability to use articane. Um, there's intraligamentary injections, um, intraosseous injections. And so we have um, a lot of different modes of anesthesia that we can use. One yep. of the most difficult types of patients that we have and that we see in practice are those patients with vasoconstrictor intolerance. So right. if a patient cannot have epinephrine, then, and they've got a hot tooth, that's a great combination, right? So, so that's a patient that, of course, we use some sort of anesthetic without the vasoconstrictor. And that's a patient that um, if we're finding that they're not getting numb, we may want to jump to an intraosseous for them. One of the helpful tricks that I always do in getting a patient numb is, of course, after I anesthetize, before I even pick up a handpiece or put the rubber dam on them, I will retest this tooth um, to make sure that they are not feeling anything. So, you know, just yep. taking a little bit of endo ice and spraying it on the cotton pellet and placing it right at the cervical margin of the tooth, you know, that's, that's a, a nice kind of confirmation before we put the rubber dam on and then take the hand piece and then we're surprised and now we have to take everything off. Yeah, I found on some first molars on the maxillary that you need to put quite a lot on the palatal side as well, which I guess some people miss. Sometimes the buckle is a long way away from the palatal root. Um, and I found that, you know, even half a cartridge, full cartridge on the inside on the palate really, really helps. Absolutely, absolutely. And another thing on the upper molars, 
if we're having difficulty in anesthetizing, doing both buccal and palatal infiltration, try a posterior superior alveolar block. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that can work really well. Um, so I think that's kind of anesthesia out of the way. Guys, we're going to rattle through these quite, quite nicely because um, we are going to go into depth on a lot of things in future episodes. So make sure to kind of uh, watch out for those. Um, this is very much a, we'll start from the top and then work into things more uh, in depth. So if you think we're going quite fast, that's what. <laughs> um, so then we're looking at the patient's disposition. Are they, you know, cooperative are they crying uh are they on the floor fetal etc yes so of course in endo we deal with a whole range of patients mm. and um you know when we're working with our referring dentists we know that they are very grateful to be able to refer some of these patients away and sometimes it would be nice if we had as specialists someplace to refer these patients to because we know that some of these patients can be, um, you know, not on purpose, but some of these patients are, are much more sensitive, they're hyper reactive, and mm -hmm. we need to handle them in such a way that they have a, a good experience in, in our hands. So, um, one of the things that is important to know that previous studies have shown that patients who are um, much more sensitive, much more emotional to begin with, those are the ones that are going to be feeling more pain during and more pain postoperatively. So, you know, we want to do everything that we can to keep them comfortable during the procedure. Um, if they are cooperative, no problem. If they're anxious but cooperative, no problem. The key there is, I think, to keeping them comfortable, keeping them calm, and keeping them stable. So uh, those patients, mm, if, if your general dentist and your patient is extremely anxious and you just want to refer them, then that's great. But this is a patient that I think is manageable. Mm -hmm. The high difficulty is the patients who are not cooperative. And of course, yes. you can kind of feel those patients out in terms of, is this something that they are going to be able to do this procedure? And the bottom line is we need to know, of course, we are, we are our objective is to save this tooth. We are kind of the end before the oral surgeon. Yeah. right? Doing the root canal before going yeah. to the oral surgeon to take the tooth out. So if they're uncooperative um, and they're not able to do this procedure, it's not the end of the world. They can always move towards extraction. But if we can help them, then there might be a chance that they can save this tooth. So, of course, we fill out each situation. There are situations where we can premedicate the patient, um, give them something that they can be a little bit more relaxed. A lot of times that will help the patient. Um, but I think it's just really a skill also to be yeah, able to deal be with your, these patients. Your, your mannerisms and stuff. So you kind of have to work that one out yourself a little bit, don't you? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, I hope that one's useful, guys. And then we're looking at gag reflex. Is that something that you test for? Because I don't really, I say, do you have a gag reflex? Or maybe you see when you take the x ray? Because um, you don't want to go poking around. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, a gag reflex, usually that's something that my yeah. assistants will tell me. Mm. Because my assistants in my practice, my assistants are the ones who take all of the initial radiographs. And um, so they'll, they'll be able to tell me, or sometimes I'll be able to hear what's going on in the operatory. Um, if the patient is gagging when they're having a CBCT taken, right? And you know the CBCT that's just only a tiny little thing that goes yeah. in their mouth, then yeah. you know you're in trouble. Oh, and we yeah. had one of those the other day. But um, if, they're, if they're able to sometimes tolerate a radiograph, um, inside their mouth, then most likely we can get it done. If they're not able to tolerate anything in their mouth, then that's going to be a very difficult type of situation. Mm. Um, sometimes uh, by doing, of course, we have all of these little tricks, 
like salt on the palate, um, tricks of if it's um, a maxillary molar tooth and we give them the palatal anesthesia, sometimes that will calm down the gag reflex. But I think that for the most part, once the assistant tells me that this patient is, is gagging or has a significant gag reflex, during my examination, I'll be able to tell is this something that is, is workable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess if you can get a mirror down there, you'll know whether you can get clamps on. And generally, once you get the clamp on, they tend to relax a bit anyway. So That's right. You'll be able to work it out from there. Uh, the next thing we kind of look at is the condition in which the patient has come in, how painful it is, swelling, all these kinds of things. How much does that affect what we do? This is um, something that as an endodontist, we deal with every day. And also as general dentists, of course, you're seeing these patients in these situations. So um, starting from minimal, minimal pain and swelling, that's something that's easy. Um, oftentimes these are patients that can be managed either if you're not starting treatment that day, you can possibly manage them with medication until they're able to get a normal appointment either with the general dentist or with the specialist. So no yeah. problem there. Moderate pain or swelling, then of course we want to look at this a little bit more carefully because we know that these situations that are moderate of course, can really start to take off in a short amount of time. So it's important that this, number one, we take the history. Yes. We get a timeline. How quickly this, did this, was this onset? And then we make a game plan. If this is something that is progressing quickly, then we know that we need to get in there and we need to um, relieve, no. right, eliminate that source of the infection, access the tooth at least, um, and then move forward from there. If they are having severe pain and they're not having swelling, then that's something that can be managed by the endodontic treatment. Severe swelling, then we want to look at that a little bit differently. Do they need an incision and drainage? Because oftentimes doing just the endodontic access will not help that swelling at all so um, it's very important to look at all of these and of course if they are starting to have really severe swelling that is starting to compromise the airway or starting to really um, go upwards or whatnot then we want to make sure that we are contacting our oral surgical colleagues and make sure that we have that team approach in managing this situation because mm -hmm. we never want to put a patient in a life-threatening situation yeah. just because we want to do the endo. Yeah, it's not common. You also have your antibiotics if you have got systemic involvement. So you're checking for your lymph nodes and, uh, and that kind of thing, which can help as well. So uh, you have a number of kind of little bits at your, uh, in your arsenal there to, to work with and just to use appropriately. Absolutely. Um, so that kind of takes away the patient side of things, the patient considerations. Uh, we're then looking towards uh, diagnostics, things that we can look at inside the mouth and be a bit more uh, definitive with because we're not relying on the patient for these things. I guess apart from maybe diagnosis. I'm just going to find a pen one second. Yeah. So diagnosis we have as our first thing, whether it's been easy to work it out or whether it's been a little bit more clouded, unclear. Right, right. And um, you did a great session with Dr. Reza Farshi. Um, I watched it, it was great. And he, he is, he is. And so he talked about diagnosis. Um, and of course, one of the things that he talked about is that diagnosis is both a science and an art. So, you know, we, we have all, everything on paper in terms of what we know and what we've learned for diagnosis, but a lot of this also comes from practice and from um, seeing these patients year after year and really developing a system on how to approach these patients. Yeah. So, you know, the very, very minimal difficulty cases are those in which you can um, adequately diagnose this this case and being, of course, there are two, two categories in 
in terms of endodontic diagnosis for every tooth, that's the pulpal and periapical. Yeah. So if you're able to um, really reliably diagnose this patient's pulpal and periapical disease, then once you have the diagnosis, then you're ready to go ahead and, and make some decisions on treatment. Yeah. Yeah. If there is um, any sort of question in terms of the differential diagnosis, then you really want to look very carefully at everything in terms of the clinical signs and symptoms and the history of this. Things that can make this um, very confusing is, you know, is what the history of this patient and their disease has been. Also patients that have had a history of chronic oral facial pain or, or chronic pain elsewhere, that can be a very, very difficult as well. We just want to make sure that we're not going in and treating a tooth if it is not going to solve the problem for the patient. Mm, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that has been, has been really a game changer for endodontists and practitioners everywhere is the ability to use um, three-dimensional cone beam computed tomography, CBCT, uh, uh, yeah. for diagnosis of, of these cases. So we're able to see in three dimensions, is there any widening of the periodontal ligament at the apices? Is there any signs of lateral wider, widening of the periodontal ligament space that would be indicative of more perio issue or fractures? We can mm -hmm. also see on upper molars and premolars endodontic um, or mucositis of endodontic origin. That's when we have an inflammation in the lining of the sinus directly over a tooth that is yeah. kind of a precursor to even having widening of the periodontal ligament space. So these, these tools have been very, very, um, very Game useful. Changer. Game changer. Yeah. yeah. So if there's any question, you're not quite sure, that's something that definitely refer it to an endodontist because they would have the tools and the experience to diagnose yeah. these cases. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of picks off our second bit, which is radiographic difficulties as well. If you're not sure from the radiograph, cone beam is the way to go forward. Um, and of course, people with a cone beam are going to be able to see a little bit more than uh, anyone with a two-dimensional image. Um, it's also best to take a uh, bite wing and a couple of periapicals from different angulations. Absolutely. Uh, if you are trying to work out, you know, extra canals, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, second angulation is always good. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and as a rule, I think, especially for molars, premolars, you always want to take that straight on, a little bit of a shift for periapical radiographs because mm -hmm. otherwise um, the superimposition of those multiple roots or whatnot, you're not seeing the full picture. And then the bite wing gives you an idea of what that occlusal table in comparison or the distance between that and the pulp chamber. Is there any sort of calcification? Is there anything questionable? Also, the bite wing is indispensable for being able to see the level of the osseous crest adjacent to the tooth so that if you're seeing any sort of angulation of the, the bone against the, the tooth, then we know that this is something that we are thinking about either a periodontal issue or a fracture. Yeah, yeah. I, I always find it's very useful for my access as well. How deep is that, you know, top of the pulp chamber? So I can kind of preempt how deep I can be going and I know if I'm going off piece then um, at that level. Uh, then we're looking at position in the arch. These are very simple things, so I'll kind of rattle through them because I don't think it needs too much explanation from yourself. Something simple is anterior or premolars, you know, quite far forward in the mouth and not much uh, in terms of the inclinations and rotations. Guys, we will come to the, your questions at the end. I have been writing them down, uh, so don't worry about that. Um, something a bit more difficult in the medium sort of category is the molar, a bit further back in the mouth. And then we're looking at a little bit more kind of um, rotations and inclinations. So is the tooth tipped? Is it not tipped? It's going to make it either sometimes easier, I guess, if it's a back tooth tip forward, you can get in there. But <laughs> if it's tipped backwards, then we have a bit more difficulty trying to get right. back there. Uh, right. 
And then obviously you have second molars, third molars, which are right at the back, hard to get to. Gag reflex is more of an issue there. And you're also again, looking at, you know, extreme inclinations. Again, I reckon an eight, which is tipped forward 40 degrees is going to be right, a nice, easy one. If it's, right. uh, if it's tipped backwards, then you're thinking, no, oh, maybe that should come out. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anything needs to be added there. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. And also the rotation, you know, the mm. rotation of the tooth in the arch, that's something to look at. The yeah. especially tricky ones for those are the teeth that have been crowned. So if sure. you have a tooth that is rotated, but it's crowned to make it look like it's in alignment, yeah. Yeah. then we want to be very careful about those. Yeah, absolutely, because you need to adjust your access, which is why you should really take crowns off, right? Right. That it, it's <laughs> it's a lucky day when we can take the crowns off. That's that gives us a really a full clear picture. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I tend to say, look, there's probably some decay under there. Do we want to leave that and have it reinfect and do it all again? And they usually say, oh, probably not. <laughs> so yeah. let's do there, guys. Yeah. Um, then we're looking at isolation because we have to have this good rubber dam isolation in order to use our hypochlorite in order to keep bacteria away from the canal to make your job a bit easier is it going to be easy to put the dam on are you going to have to build the tooth up somehow first how is that going to go down so you need to assess that as well any any comments around that yeah isolation is one of the most important things that we do once we start working on a tooth you know, um, and I've, I've spoken to the first year residents about this this week. One of the things that you don't want to do is once you put that rubber dam, you don't want to have to struggle during the whole entire procedure with saliva leaking in or, you know, things coming up. Because again, if you have that contamination coming up underneath your rubber dam, then we are carrying that into the tooth. Um, one of the things that I have done since the very beginning, um, since my residency is that once I put, first of all, we want to make sure that that tooth before we isolate it, we're making sure that there's no calculus on it, that there's no plaque on it. I mean, that's, that's very simple, basic, but oftentimes people forget that. And then once we put the rubber dam on, I disinfect both the tooth and then the rubber dam. The, and going back to one of the other classic studies by Moller, M-O-L-L-E-R, um, what I do is I disinfect that tooth with so um, peroxide, high percentage of peroxide to bubble up any sort of plaque, bacteria, and whatnot. And then we disinfect both the tooth and the rubber dam with iodine, potassium iodide, much like a surgical field. So again, you're not carrying the bacteria from your field into the tooth. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that zoning kind of principle. So taking that from big surgery into little surgery here, which is- That's really right, funny. that's right. And dental students and residents, just a reminder, do your, do your professors and instructors a favor before you call them over to look at your case, make sure your rubber dam isolation is perfect. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess that's something that you have to learn over time. It's not, it's not an easy skill to learn, but once it, you get good at it, uh, it makes your life so easy. If right. you're one who's doing general dentistry as well, if you can get a quadrant isolated, life is so easy. It's nice and quiet. Uh, everything goes everything goes well. That's you right. Blink stick, all of that. Um, That's right. So again, you're going to have a look at the tooth, decide whether it's an easy one, a bit more difficult. You're going to have to do, you know, pre-treatment modifications, and that's going to make it mild, moderate, difficult in terms of the difficulty scale. Um, you're then going to look kind of we spoke about this already about mm -hmm. what the crown looks like is there a restoration there is it a bridge um does it is it heavily destroyed you know all those kinds of things and you'll be able to kind of assess again is it going to be easy difficult or not right right and you know the only thing that i i really should add here is that um one of the things that we see a lot as specialists is a patient coming from a general dentist where they've attempted to do a root canal on a premolar or anterior tooth. Of course, we, we think, oh, premolars and anteriors, they're easy teeth to do root canals mm -hmm. on. But once you put a crown on that tooth, 
it makes it very difficult. I mean, even for an endodontist, when we're looking at especially lower incisors, uh, there's yeah. so little room for error. So, you know, if you've got a tooth like that with a crown on it, or even a tooth with a lower molar with some calcification on it, you have to be right on. Your axis needs to be like bullseye and keep it small because if you start removing so much dentin in order to locate that canal, then you're compromising the structure of that tooth. Yeah, so. which is one of the reasons that I'm obsessed with Bobby Nardo's work, you know, guided accesses. Um, it just it, it makes it, especially for the lower incisors, because I, I dislike lower incisors, I'll be honest, guys. Uh, they give me nightmares sometimes, um, especially with two roots in there, don't forget. Uh, getting it right is so very difficult and uh, and you can be easily overly destructive, as you say. Right, right. Um, so yeah, that was the morphology aberrations or not. Guys, the, this is a really good form, so make sure you have a look at it. You'll see a lot more um, in detail what we're talking about and you can kind of have a little think about it if you're unsure about something give myself and dr perry a message um you're then looking about at the x-ray aren't we uh, we're now looking towards apexes we're looking towards curvatures um and splits etc right right so of course this is where your radiographs are so important any sort of um, curvature, significant curvature of that root, root canal and whatnot, that, um, that really contributes to how difficult the case is. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, of course, the CBCT, again, can really allow us to take a look at not just the curvature in one plane, but curvature in multiple planes, as well as when root root canals join, sometimes they join with a very kind of a a sharp angle yep. or they will have you'll have a single kind of canal here with a tiny little canal going off at a very sharp angle so those type of situations can be much more much more challenging apical diameter that's something that we want to look at in terms of um, how open is that root apex the younger mm -hmm. person is the higher possible probability that there is that they will have a wider open apex or if the tooth has devitalized when the patient was very young it will have an open apex the open apices in, in a skilled clinician's hands is very predictable but if you don't have the training or the right tools and materials you can have a big mess out the apex. Mm. So it's really important, um, how do we handle these? And then of course, if the patient is very young, it would affect your treatment plan because there are things like a regenerative endodontic procedures or um, even vital pulp therapy in, in cases in which the pulp is vital or having an irreversible pulpitis, we know that we can, we can use these vital pulp therapy procedures in order to maintain that vitality of the pulp to allow that root to continue to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And with kids teeth, we will be speaking to Dr. Lolo at some point. I know everyone loves his dances, but he actually does dentistry as well. So uh, we'll be testing his knowledge there. So look out for that one in the future as well. Um, so yeah, we've done kind of the radiographic appearance of the canals and the root morphology, but actually the actual canal themselves can be sclerosed, the pulp chamber can be receded, uh, and that can make our job more or less difficult, you know, if it's an open or closed one, following the line of the canal, can we see it all the way down to the apex? You're again gonna work out whether it's gonna be difficult or not. Absolutely. You know, in terms of the canal radiographic appearance, one of the things that you really want to look at is, of course, if there is any significant calcification, there are varying degrees of that. Um, and if there is a really calcified tooth, one of the things that I really want to stress is that just because you cannot see a canal on a radiograph does not mean that it is not treatable. Mm -hmm. So in the right hands, a tooth like that is oftentimes treatable with yep. conventional root canal therapy. And you know, that would be a case where you would want to have that, um, that three-dimensional comb beam. 
Um, of course, we all know what a calcified tooth looks like. Sure. But in terms of looking at the radiographic appearance as well, especially with molars, there's so much variability in terms of the anatomy. And one of the things that we want to keep in mind is the MB2s in upper molars. And some studies have shown that the MB2 in upper first molars has an incidence of as high as 90%. Yes. So, and that is with the use of a microscope um, and microsurgical instruments. So if you're, and that same study showed that when the practitioner didn't use those, those the high level magnification of a microscope and microsurgical instruments, he was only able to find those MB2 73% of the time. So that 17% increase in the ability to find that MB2 with the microscope. So if you're not finding that, or if you think that there is one, refer it out to a specialist because that the MB2 is, yeah, and more predictable. And the MB2 is the reason why we see these teeth fail mm -hmm. the most. Um, the other thing is that lower molars. This is something that is very important as well. About 46% of lower molars have a middle mesial canal between yeah, their yeah. mesial buccal and mesial lingual. And this is something that traditionally we don't learn about in dental school or, you know, nobody ever talked to me about that during my dental school or my residency. Um, but when it's there, that can be the source of a failure of that treatment. Absolutely. So um, they're more common in lower first molars. And the younger a patient is, the more chance that that's going to be there. Yeah. And then yeah. there's the C-shaped canals as well. I, I love those. I, I was <laughs> excited when I see them. <laughs> yeah, the, the C-shaped canals are, are just fantastic. Mm. Um, one of the studies had shown that a C-shaped canal can be present in up to 12% of lower, lower second molars. And that's a pretty high percentage, right? So if you're looking at a tooth, uh, lower second molars mostly, and you're seeing that is conical, then you can kind of suspect there might be a C-shaped canal anatomy there. And that would be a tooth that I would want to have a CBCT on. Mm -hmm. um, also, it has been shown that the C-shaped canals have a higher incidence of up to 39% in East Asian populations. So there's been a lot of studies out of Asian countries and whatnot showing the incidence of, of the C-shaped canals in those I populations. Got, I think I've got a couple on my lowers where they're definitely <laughs> monocle. Uh, I had yeah. made that a while back and I, I, I didn't notice that. So hopefully I'll never need an endo. I've not had a feeling so far. So um, let's hope I don't end up needing one. Uh, but, but it'll be a fun one if you do. I don't think I'll do it myself. But... <laughs> Um, so, yeah. And then um, one other thing that I should mention is, um, especially in these lower second molars, is radiographically, we want to look at what is the proximity to the inferior alveolar nerve canal. Mm -hmm. That is something that is so important. And, you know, we want to keep our patients safe. We want to keep them healthy. And this is something that, again, um, it can be very easily overlooked if we're just looking at, oh, let me get this root canal done. But especially lower second molars can have very close proximity to that, that IAN. Mm -hmm. So if, for me, I would always want to take a CBCT to, to see exactly where it is. Yeah. If my um, apical foramen is sitting right on top of the inferior alveolar nerve canal, then I know that I want to be super careful. If I'm using calcium hydroxide, I do not want a drop of that calcium hydroxide to touch that nerve. If I'm using BC sealer, I do not want that external puff because both of those things going into the IAN canal can oh, cause paresthesia. Mm -hmm. And you know we've seen these horrible cases. Dr. Gluskin, who's our immediate past president, he did a paper in, in Journal of American Dental Association last year showing these really um, catastrophic cases in which calcium hydroxide basically filled that whole IAN. Um, yeah. So we want to be really, and they, that can have devastating effects for the patient. Yeah, I wonder whether someone should add it onto the uh, assessment form, where is the IAN? 
<laughs> because actually, actually we're we're working on that through the AAE and the Practice Affairs Committee. I just exchanged some emails this past week, and we're looking to add a couple of things. That's one yeah. of them. That was my idea, by the way. So if I could have my name next to it, that'd be great. <laughs> Um, no, it's fine. Uh, resorption is next on the list again. Yes. You can see that very obviously. Is there resorption uh, on the apices? Is there something mid route? Uh, something to then look at, which of course then needs to most likely, well, you definitely want to referral because it's going to need a cone beam. You right. might need a surgical technique to remove that source of the uh, resorption. Uh, I don't think it's something that G GDPs are equipped to deal with. I, at my stage, I wouldn't deal with that at the moment. Um, I'm very early on in my end of life. So uh, even for myself, I would be referring that out to someone like yourself yeah. or Karina, um, who's really, really good at those. She loves them. Yeah. And the one um, piece of advice that I have for, for any general practitioner, if you see any sign of resorption on your radiograph, hmm. refer it to get a 3D CBCT right now. Mm -hmm. Do not watch this because there is no way for you to know what the extent of that resorptive defect is. And if you're just watching it, we're, you're just watching it to wait for it to grow. Yeah. Right. So yeah. oftentimes we'll, we'll see a patient who is sent to our office and they say, Oh yeah, my, my doctor has been watching this for the past five years and now it's completely blown out and there's nothing we can do. Yeah. And we're, we're thinking, well, why did you, well, what were you watching for, right? Mm. If you see it, get a CBCT. Maybe they didn't like the patient. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the way, um, yeah. Dr., Dr. Shannon Patel, he's developed the three-dimensional classification for root resorption. Yeah. So I think that um, that's something that you could, you could look up online. It's fantastic. And then, of course, we have the two-dimensional cl classification, which is the Heather Safe classification that is, is also used, but not as uh, specific as his. Mm. Yeah, I've actually not spoken to him yet, and maybe that's a good thing to bring him in for, uh, which I'll have a little think about afterwards, see if you can get hold of him. Um, that's kind of most of the diagnostic considerations. You then have additional bits. Uh, which very quickly I'll, I'll just rattle through because I know we're going to talk about trauma with another clinician. So we'll go depth, in depth onto that one. Um, so you have trauma. Is there any fracture of the tooth, anything, subluxation or bits and pieces like that? You also have complicated fractures, root fracture, is the alveolus intact? Um, and then you've got the luxations and, and avulsion, which avon, avulsions, I can't get it out of my mouth, which will change your management. Um, and make it much more difficult. Um, so we'll talk about trauma with, I can't see it, but we have someone to talk about trauma. <laughs> uh, we also then have previous history of treatment endontically. Has it been accessed? Has it been complications when it's been accessed? Is there a perforation? If somebody's done a previous endo, we're looking at ledges, are we looking at uh, blockages? file breakages, all these kinds of things, which are going to then make your life more difficult. That's right. That's right. And, you know, if a, a tooth has already been root canal treated, mm. um, those, those are situations where, again, the CBCT preoperatively is very important to determine what we're looking at. Um, and, you know, those, those, are, those are difficult, oftentimes difficult types of cases. Um, and... Again, use your endodontist for those. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's kind of most of it. Then we have perioendo, uh, which you either have none, do your pocket charting across the mouth, find out, work out whether it's primary endo, primary perio, and then treat the case accordingly. Again, we're going to be talking to uh, Her Holiness the Pulp about perioendo. And I'm also thinking to bring in an actual periodontist to do that from the other side as well. So. Uh, we'll cover that pretty extensively, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's great. And um, in the perio endo um, theme, what we're also looking at, of course, is cracked teeth. And of course, this past year and a half with COVID, we're seeing more 
cracked teeth than ever. Mm -hmm. So the things that we're looking for with that is any of those. Yeah, right. I feel so it. Any, I feel yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> any of those vertical tunneling defects, again, that we can see with CBCT mm -hmm. um, adjacent to a fracture line. And with these, we know that there are are multiple studies out there that are showing that if we have a five millimeter or more perioprobing defect in these areas, then our, our likelihood that that tooth will be successful after a year is very low. Um, so we want to really make sure that we're diagnosing these properly so that we can give this patient a good treatment recommendation. Um, and in addition to that, we know that sometimes when we're starting to see these fractures going just slightly past the orifice or whatnot, these are not teeth that we automatically need to, to discard or have extracted. There are different modalities where we can go in and treat these and repair these fractures internally, um, get cuspal coverage on them. And a lot of times, depending on where these teeth are and the position in the arch, we can really reliably give these teeth a good long-term prognosis. Absolutely. Uh, so guys, that is kind of the end of the plan session. What I'll do now is end this live and then restart it straight away and we'll just go through some free form questions. I've written down the questions that people have asked, so we'll go through those first. Uh, and we'll do about 10 to 15 minutes because you have a quarter past appointment, don't you? Yes, I do. So uh, big thank you to yourself for coming on. Uh, make sure if you're watching back on YouTube to subscribe, to follow Dr. Perry on Instagram, uh, and also to uh, turn on live notifications for the next sessions. Guys, we'll be back if you're watching live in two minutes uh, to do the Q&A, and then we will be done with that. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody out there is staying safe. Absolutely. Thank you.